Hello and welcome to another episode of the Business of Business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, we are the podcast that brings you a wide variety of guests that can talk about a diverse set of topics. Uh, we want to try to point some things out that maybe you hadn't thought about or either provide support for things that are keeping you up at night. We also have professionals in many different fields that come on, give us their expert opinion, and today is no different. We are uh, excited to have Felix K.O. back with us. He has accrued over 15 years of business experience when it comes to sales and marketing. He has been featured in major media outlets such as the Huff Post, Ad Week, and Authority Magazine, and also appeared on major Canadian morning radio show to talk about neuromarketing and the 2019 Canadian election. You can find him on numerous top podcasts where he shares neuromarketing insights on how businesses can grow and thrive during the pandemic and then, of course, moving forward in 2021. Today at his neuromarketing company called Happy Buying Brain, he is combining his 15 years of business experience with his educational background in biology, science, and psychology to help businesses truly understand what makes their customers' brains tick when it comes to better achieving customer brand loyalty over their competitors through the power of marketing, implementing neuromarketing into their own marketing campaigns. Felix, thanks so much and welcome to the show again. We appreciate you coming back to talk with us. Hi, Roy. Well, thank you for having me back on the show. I definitely appreciate it. This is exciting. Yeah, for uh, for visitors, for new listeners that mm -hmm. maybe didn't hear, uh, uh, you know, your history before, just give us a brief rundown of kind of uh, what led you to this spot in life. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, in your introduction, and thank you for, for the introduction, many, many, many thanks there. So as you touched on, uh, you know, I come from an educational background that uh, strongly resides in biological science and psychology. Right. So um, that was um, so initially the uh, journey was to go into uh, more of the medical field uh, during that time. But then I got introduced, obviously, to the world of business. And um, and from there on, uh, you know, got involved in uh, things, uh, industries such as the finance and investments, uh, which eventually segued into the world of uh, technology. So, um, you know, mobile in the 2010s was very, very popular. It was a growing field. Um, so, you know, I spent nearly a, a decade there and, and just coming out of it now is, um, is uh, I believe that we're at uh, the cusp of another technological revolution, mainly in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, virtual reality. When I looked at the landscape of where, uh, let's say, technology was going and how it was going to penetrate everyday life was that uh, neuroscience was actually uh, the core of a lot of these innovations. So as we were familiar with, um, you know, anything that becomes uh, familiarized or uh, really popular, um, concepts that are related to it also become more mainstream, right? So when I, um, so when neuroscience is now applied to the field of, let's say, medicine and uh, technology, uh, what I saw was, you know, for, um, for the growth of the entire discipline was that actually is going to start to become a lot more permeated in all the different areas of our lives. And, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I saw was that neuroscience was going to be a huge thing when it came to marrying the world, uh, the scientific world with marketing and sales and business in general. So, um, you know, it's really a combination of uh, educational background, you know, 15 plus years of experience, having an extensive, uh, you know, background in terms of now uh, technology over a decade, and the timing right now seems to be uh, ripe for neuromarketing. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I think it is, <clears throat> like you said, it is time. There's so much, um, and it, there's just so much coming at the daily, at the consumer on a daily basis that mm -hmm. we have to find a way to, you know, kind of hit, get to the heart of the issue or whatever they're needing and how right. to best speak to them because we all like, we all like our messaging somewhat, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure there's groups, but different mm -hmm. groups like different messaging and different things we can do to attract them that may turn another group completely off. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. It's just, so narrow marketing uh, is really the window that allows, let's say companies to gain that much deeper understanding of, you know, the underlying uh, mechanisms that are happening inside their consumers' brains so that they could craft their marketing messages to connect with them, uh, you know, a, a lot better. Right. 
Yeah, and we I think we touched on this a little bit last time, but it's not mm-hmm. only the marketing message, but right. it's also the packaging of the product. And it, there's just so much more that, you know, companies really do give a lot of thought over. Yeah, 100% there. So obviously core brand messaging is a huge component, but it's the entire experience, right? Because, you know, you just don't go to a restaurant and just have a good meal. It's the atmosphere, everything that comes along with it, very similar to, um, you know, when a consumer has brand loyalty to a specific company, the product is great, let's say, but it's also the entire experiencing the packaging. Um, you know, Apple Tiffany's is notorious for the sound that comes when you, when, uh, you know, somebody opens the, the, the packaging to, you know, it, it uh, all that stuff adds to the experience for sure. So companies do put in a lot of uh, thought into all the details um, in addition to the core brand messaging. Yeah. And there's different, um, it just I don't want to de- belabor it, but just the, uh, mm-hmm. I think it was uh, oh, uh, one of the chip manufacturers. Uh, yeah. Frito-Lays. Frito-Lays. No, oh, well, I was thinking uh, uh, Intel. You know, yeah. they had, oh, chip. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. They had that little, um, uh, it was just like a little bong, bong, bing, bong, bong, you know, whenever yeah. they, it was instantly recognizable, you didn't have to read the copy or hear what was said, but once you heard that sound instantly brand, you knew that it was <laughs> Intel, right? Yeah. 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 And I didn't mean to interrupt you on the, the other chip. Sorry about that. So, uh, what, what was the, the Frito? Oh, free to lays. Uh, but that's a, first of all, um, before we get into that, that's a, a wonderful way for a company to associate, let's say the ping of a noise and then, a, and then having that connect to their brand. Right. So just the fact that, you know, their consumers would hear that sound would activate in their brains, this kind of like this narrow map of yeah. uh, all their experiences, memories, thoughts, and so forth to bring their product or an, uh, and their brand top of mind. Yeah. Right. So it's, simple. it's a simple concept, a noise re- and a reaction. But I know that figuring that out is probably not that's not the simple part. I mean, it's probably a lot of years of research. And oh, 100 percent. Go into that. Yeah, it's the same idea. I know that uh, Google uses a specific blue because they've ran tons and tons of tests of it to get people to click on it. So that's one example of something that seems so simple of having the, the, the color of, let's say, uh, you know, a little, so, some, some words, but also it would impact, um, you know, uh, their users, uh, let's say, wanting to, to, um, to click on those words, right, based on, on the color itself. So it's a, similar to the same idea of that building the association between a sound and then connecting it with the brand. Right, right. So, um, what was the, uh, we're going to talk about the Frito-Lay. What were you going to say? About oh that? yeah. It, it was just a matter of how, when uh, we're talking about the importance of not only core brand messaging, but also the packaging, yeah. right? So, you know, at that time, uh, you know, in the two, late 2000s, close to 2010s, their Frito-Lays, um, you know, was looking to gain a greater market share into their female audience and what they're found, what they found um, when they ran, um, you know, studies, brain studies, is that um, the packaging was actually done in a, in a in a shiny type of format, right? And that would activate an area of the brain that was, uh, you know, responsible for decision making, but also guilt. So um, that, uh, you know, revealed that there was an association happening in the brains of the female participants that whenever, um, you know, the, their participants would uh, view a shiny uh, their current shiny uh, free to lace package that it would also, um, you know, trigger uh, feelings of guilt eating it, right? So in order for them to, to um, actually, you know, create a different, a much more positive association, they uh, changed their packaging from a shiny style to a more of a beige matte style. And what they found when they, when they actually conducted uh, brain studies was there's a, a dramatic reduction in that same area. So now that would, that indicated or uh, suggested that, um, you know, that um, the responses from their female participants was a lot more positive to the new packaging. Interesting. Yeah. It's amazing how our brain works and just something so subtle can make such a huge big difference, difference right? Yeah. It's a huge nudge for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioned females and not to pick on them, but I'm sure that consumer mm. goods, because they're right. the ones in the grocery store typically shopping, I'm sure that yeah. the consumer goods do a lot of studies you know based on females mm-hmm. yeah well when we look at it, like females uh in general um 
you know, in terms of the decision making for purchasing, it could be as high as 80%. So they're the really main drivers when it comes to, um, you know, making a lot of the consumer choices, right? And, um, you know, is this, is this very important in terms of, you know, there's a lot of similarities in terms of brain structure, but there's also some some common or some some differences that play into the um, you know decision making process that companies should be aware of, right? Mm-hmm. And and some of them are um, some of these brain, brain structures are the limbic system. So that system is uh, more involved in let's say things such as emotions, memories, and uh, you know and, and social situations, right? Mm-hmm. So the the way that that plays out in terms of the the world of marketing is that. When, um, let's say, for example, a company that is looking to, let's say, put out an ad that's targeted to more towards female, um, one of the biggest thing is social harmony, for example, because that part of the brain, the limbic system, you know, one of its core functions is to um, evaluate uh, things on a social situation. And, um, and from an evolutionary point of view as well, that's actually um, increases the chances of, um, let's say, gathering food for example, to bring back to the family or for child rearing, where even to today, um, you know, you, you have play dates and, and you have moms coming together and, and, and all that stuff is, is really the genesis of, um, you know, that, that part of the brain that uh, looks at things from a, from a social point of view, right? So um, for, for a company to come in and create, let's say, an ad to really want to emphasize that social aspect and, you um, and show, let's say, you know, people in close proximity, but to take that even a, a notch higher is to actually um, have the, uh, let's say the people in the ad actually physically touching each other because that actually activates um, what we call oxytocin, which is a, near, uh, which is a hormone that uh, is responsible for bonding, right? Mm-hmm. So this is something that's very common when, let's say, a, a mother has a, a baby yeah. during that time. Interesting. Yeah. So, um- I guess there's, um, well, there used to be an old saying that said that we buy on emotion and Mm -hmm. then we justify with logic. Does does that still pretty much hold true? Yeah, absolutely. Like one of the things is there's something called bottom up processing. So everyone understands or is familiar with left and right brain, right? So left is more logical, right is like more the creative side, but really, um, the flow of information. So this is very important that, um, that to mention as well is, is understanding how the brain is structured and how information physically enters the brain. Yeah. So a lot of that will actually support, uh, you know, the whole notion of buying based on emotion and uh, backing up based on logic, right? So the flow from the bottom up is actually at the base of your brain is, um, you know, you, you really have your reptilian brain, right? Or your physical brain, yeah. because so that's really responsible. You know, it's, it's fast, impulsive, um, reflexive, and it's really responsible for your fight or flight type of responses, right? So information goes from that to assess situations that are, uh, let's say, a threat or non-threat to uh, the individual. And let's say that it passes from there into the next level, which is the midbrain, the limbic system that we touched on that was more deals with uh, emotions, memories, and uh, social situations. So it starts to look at things from, you know, like from an emotion point of view, what kind of associations you have with that, do you have good memories or thoughts of um, you know, something of the stimuli, and then who else is kind of using this kind of thing, right? And then it passes on to finally the last part of the brain, which is the cortex, uh, and that's your logical part of the brain. So it starts to look at things from, you know, like a statistical point of view, figures, facts, and things like that. So when you actually see how that path of information gets gets traveled, at first, that's where the emotion kind of comes in at the midbrain. And then um, let's say that someone makes a purchase, and then it finally gets to the last part of the brain to receive information, which is the cortex. And that's the logical part. Yeah, and uh, I think I was just thinking about car and truck advertising and the difference mm-hmm. because typically, you know, the woman would drive the car. Right. But you see, like you said, the touching, you usually see them taking uh, a lot of times children to mm-hmm. events or dropping them yeah. off at school. But then when we, uh, you know, you never see them like a guy splitting a uh, 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 injector, fuel injector open and saying, hey, look at the flow of fuel through this thing. But, exactly. But when we talk about the trucks, I guess targeting men in the group mm-hmm. is, you know, it's a lot more about 
the power and how tough it is, you know, dropping stuff in the bed of it, not too many people hugging and, you know, doing all the, yeah, a hundred percent, right. If, if you're looking towards <laughs> something that's gravitating uh, more to the social concept, then, then of course it's more like, Oh, we, we you want to buy this SCV because you could fit the family in there and you have more space for, let's say the baby stroller, so to speak. But uh, you know, for, for let's say the male demographic, you know, that might be important as well, but it's also, um, you know, like, can I take this off-roading, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, so, so it's, it's kind of like a different um, type of approach, even though there is crossover, but, um, you know, probably uh, off-roading is on the mind of, of most male consumers who are looking at bigger vehicles, especially trucks, right? Exactly. So, uh, you know, it, it's, we're in an interesting time coming out of the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. have, have you noticed any, uh, are there any large consumer shifts that are happening or is everybody still kind of holding back kind of still wait and see attitude right this moment yeah that's a good question uh, i think right now it's maybe a combination of both i think from the consumer point of view uh you know it, it seems like they like from, uh, the consumers want to go out and actually experience life again and, and from a business point of view um of course they're looking to make up for that revenue but also at the same time being very strategic in terms of how um, they reopen. So it's, it's a little bit of this dance uh, going on because nobody knows what's going to happen, you know, in the next foreseeable future. Yeah, there was a story not, uh, I guess, this week or last week about that, that, uh, you know, while everybody was home and stranded, mm -hmm. a lot of home improvement projects. Well, yeah. Now that uh, the airlines have opened back up, people have like ditched the home improvement project yeah, and, and jump on the plane to, to go that. wherever they wanted to go. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I remember reading about that as well. Yeah. So it's, it, it's quite a, it's quite a change. And, and I think that everybody wants to kind of have things return back to normal as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, and the other thing I think, you know, for our businesses out there, they've been um, struggling with some staff shortages in place. Mm -hmm. Also some, uh, of their raw material shortages that, have right. really, you know, and talking about home builders, the price of lumber is just skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. so, but anyway, e even the local restaurants, we were talking pre-show about the, uh, you know, ingredients in some yeah. fast food restaurants that have been short. So, I mean, the, the businesses are dealing with a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there's uh, a lot of things on the, on, you know, that's on the radar for sure. Dealing with, um, you know, like workers, uh, you know, employment, can you bring in the, 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 the labor force to come in and, and run the business and all the way through to, um, you know, like the, the materials to actually create the consumer product. And, um, and, and also, you know, people are probably uh, are in a different state of mind as well um, as they make this transition into more of the social world, if you want to call it real life social world. So there's, there's a lot of different um you know, variables that come into things as, as uh, you know, we approach the next stage here. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, we were talking earlier, you mentioned mm -hmm. stress and irritation and, you know, I see that in some consumers, you know, it's just, right. it's a trying time because it's like some people are trying to open up and get back to normal and maybe mm -hmm. it's not happening as fast for them. But right. I think if uh, you're, not, you're the, uh, you're the neuroscientist that can really give the answer, but uh, do you think that there's like a lot of pent up frustration and anxiety that consumers are kind of bringing into this time period? Well, definitely. Like when we look at it from, uh, you know, a neuroscience point of view, the, the primal brain, um, you know, is certainly in a heightened state or a much more heightened state of, let's say, anxiety, anxiety, uncertainty, um, you know, due to all the turbulence that's happening. Right. So, really when you look at the brand, so the brand is this an, a, a verb or emotional state it is to really help the consumer come to a level where it alleviates a lot of those, um, let's say stresses, if you want to call it that, right? So that's the main goal of, uh, you know, of a brand to help return that level of normalcy so that they could, um, you know, just have some sense of satisfaction and fulfillment, which is something that has been, you know, highly affected over the last uh probably year and a half yeah. during that time and um and during and, and there's there's certain of course there's certain ways like on a one-to-one -one interaction or and so forth of how that would affect let's say a, a business in terms of how to um you know what would increase the effectiveness 
and we could touch on that as well. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, we, we talked about sleep being very, very important because, um, you know, try, try resolving a situation when you have, you know, one or both parties in an agitated state. <laughs> right, right, right. Like the, the primal brain is, is highly active and it shuts off the uh, cortex. So the logical, the logical part of the brain goes offline. So yeah. Yeah, go I, ahead. No, I was just going to say, and I think that we can even talk a little bit about um, how businesses really need to take care of their employees through this time, because, mm -hmm. you know, short, uh, uh, companies that are short of people, the people that do show up, they're working, right. you know, from can to can't and right. they get tired. And then it just takes one little like, Hey, you got that order wrong. And it's like, bah, you know, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's, it's unnecessary. I understand why it happens, but if we as employers, we need to not only monitor our employees, make sure they're getting their rest or have their chance to get, even if right. they say, I'm fine, I can do another double. At mm -hmm. some point we have to, you know, be the uh, logical one and say, look, you really need a rest before yeah. that. And, you know, we noticed this in, um, uh, I used to do a lot of work in the senior living industry and be like in a nursing home environment. Mm -hmm. And what we noticed was that that was when um, staff tended to be more abusive, not necessarily physical, right. but more uh, short with the residents or verbally mm -hmm. abusive when they had worked a couple of double shifts, there's not enough staff. They know they're going to have to keep doubling. They're missing their right. family events. And that their uh, agitation level just was increases, right? Yeah, it's just right on the cusp. So any little thing would just put them over the edge. And I think that we're we're not seeing it wholesale, but I think that if we're not careful, we will see a lot of that, you know, in some mm -hmm. industries out there today. Yeah, that's a great uh, great point that you brought up uh, in terms of being overworked, burned out, uh, and not having time to spend, let's say, with loved ones. And friends, and, and from a company point of view, there's, there's obviously, um, you know, there's ways to support, um, let's say, your employees and your, your and, and the people that work with you that really make the company run. And as I mentioned, one is, is sleep. And, and the reason why that's so is it does several things. It's, it actually prunes uh, the pathways in the brain uh, and really and strengthen the ones that, that are in use. So what, what that does is it, it pretty much clears the highway from, uh, for like neurons to speak to each other. So, oh. so what it does is when someone's in a confused state, it's easy to get agitated. Mm -hmm. So sleep really kind of opens up these highways so that the, you know, the cells within the brains can communicate with each other, which reduces the chances of someone getting frustrated. Oh. Right. So that's why getting adequate sleep really, really matters because it strengthens, um, you know, really highways that are important yeah. and uh, really reduces or, or cleans out uh, the ones that are not in use, right? So that's one reason. Yeah. Uh, the second reason why, um, you know, it's important to get a good rest is it, it actually allows the brain to consolidate what you learn in that day. So your memories get strengthened. So it moves it from an area called the hippocampus, which is kind of like a short term and medium term memory. And then it gets transported to your cortex for long term storage, if you want. So that way, when um, let's say, the next day you wake up well rested. Um, it's this exact same idea where uh, someone does not feel agitated because their thoughts are a lot more clear on what they need to do, right? So that's the power of the neuroscience behind you know uh, the importance of good sleep. Yeah. Uh, the other one actually is um, taking uh, walks, being around nature, um, and what it does is it calms the pi the primal brain by actually strengthening um, the cortex, which in this case, it's like, if you're to see as an organization, you have the executive team, like the leadership team that uh, let's say communicates with, um, let's say the frontline workers. And if, if the, the leadership team is, is all in disarray, then you could bet that, you know, the, the workers underneath are, are gonna do whatever they want. And, and before you know it, you just have a big mess, right? So by having a very, very strong leadership team um, that could actually help, uh, you know, communicate effectively with their workers, then you have, um, you know, something that uh, is a much more well-run organization. And, and that's what happens when, um, let's say, taking walks or being around nature is that part of the brain or the leadership team becomes a lot more strengthened and um, it's able to regulate the primal brain, uh, you know, a lot more effectively, right? So um, those are two big things to keep in yeah. mind. The third thing is um, having support programs that facilitate, uh, you know, 
being social, even having fun outside of work. Um, I think that's building that, rebuilding that camaraderie again. Yeah. I had been missing uh, for the last um, year and a half. So by yeah. combining those things is, you know, that's how companies could support their workers. Yeah. And what about stimulus? I was just thinking uh, oh. because sometimes it, it kind of acts um, like lack of sleep for me is that if you're in a heavy stimulus environment, you just got things coming at you right. constantly questions and this, and always, uh, you know, having to, you know, kind of be on, on your step thinking about this next thing. Right. If we have a lot of that in a short period of time, that can act, I, I'm asking as a question, does that act kind of like, you know, going for a long time without getting any sleep that it just wears our brain down? Yeah, hundred percent. Cause at the end of the day, our brains need time to rest and recover. Right. So burnout is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a likely scenario. So during that time, there's only so many second wins that someone could get. <laughs> right. right. So it's the same idea. So even though, you, you know, the, the person may be going off of, let's say, adrenaline and, and all the other good stuff, but that, but what ends up happening is um, it becomes a law of diminishing returns as well. So even though, let's say, um, there's, there's much more benefit to, let's say, study for you know a short period of time than just dragging it out and, and not sleeping for three days and pulling all nighters, even though if you look at the time itself, it's like, well, someone dedicated, you know, let's say 20 hours over three days, but they're not going to remember anything because as, as I mentioned before, during sleep, that's how your memories and your learning gets consolidated. Yeah. Right. So there's this kind of like this, this middle ground that um that needs to happen in terms of um optimize or optimizing someone's uh you know thought processes and and uh regulating their emotions yeah yeah and like you said that what works for me well is that walk sometimes just taking a little 15 minute walk mm -hmm. it, it makes a world of difference to just kind of clear your head and you know i know there's a lot of research on the creative part too is that mm -hmm. you know we cannot be creative when we're constantly being bombarded with stimulus, we have to have that quiet yeah. uh, time to think and be creative. Hundred percent agree with you on that. Yeah, those those walks, um, you know, they're so valuable. It, it seems, you know, it's only 15, 20 minutes, but they, but what it does on a neurological level on the brain is um, it's significant. Yeah. Right. So it's uh, yeah, it, it it just allows you know, clear thinking um, allows the, you know, the primal brain to be a lot more regulated and not under control and rather have it like act as a loose cannon. And that's when uh, a lot of the kind of irrational behaviors happen where, you know, it, it just takes a little to put someone over the top. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think you mentioned, I'm not, maybe it was pre-show or last time we talked that mm -hmm. stress can actually reduce uh, parts of the brain. Is that, did I get that right? Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. So right now, obviously, uh, for for some people, um, you know, that's a reality, right? So based on all the different circumstances, and on a brain level, what ends up happening is we talked about the the cortex, which is like the leadership executive team, right? So stress actually reduces the amount of area they call it gray area, gray area, or this think of the, that part of the brain that's your executive team, um, you know, shrinks pretty much. So they're, they're, and then what ends up happening is there's a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is your kind of your emotion uh, area of the brain that's found in the midbrain or midbrain of your primal brain. And, and that's like where a lot of your fears and, and, and that kind of stuff comes out. That area that actually grow, uh, gets bigger. So you have this executive team at the top kind of shrink, and then you have the, the amygdala, which is your emotions and, and one of its fear. Um, you know, there's, there's a big imbalance here. So, that, so that's why, um, you know, stress has a, has a, a big uh, effect on, you know, the, the areas, of the brain. And, and that's one way to look at it, as a kind of like the power of balance of a shrinking um, executive team and, and a growing, um, you know, a growing base underneath it that without control is, is, is acts like a loose cannon. Yeah. Yeah. And I know this is kind of off topic from sales and marketing, but I guess I think it's important because of the damage, um, mm -hmm. you know, if we're not careful, if we don't think all this through the right. damage that we can do to our company, to our brand that can be permanent. I mean, sometimes we don't get out from under that if we've got staff that's on the ragged edge and maybe mm -hmm. they don't treat our customers right. And then, you know, we've got, I, again, I'll ask this as a question, but it seems that we have a little bit more of the, the cancel culture 
right going on so it's like if if i come into your establishment and i feel like you've wronged me then i'm like i am never going back and i'm telling mm -hmm. everybody you know i'm telling all my friends never go back you know sometimes it amounts to something sometimes it doesn't but really as a business owner in the fragile environment that we're operating in right this moment you just can't really uh chance any of that right yeah so the council uh culture is um, especially now that everybody pretty much has a voice on social media and the, on the internet, right? So that's, um, so for a company, it's, it's almost like you, the way to really look at it is the reason why that really exists. And, and really, it's a kind of like a dichotomy of polar opposites, as I say, right? It's like, it's big contrast between A, a and B, uh, for example. Um, but to really get down to it is to really break out this us versus them type of thinking yeah. is to find a way to make, you know, as, as the, your consumer base as inclusive as possible in different circles. So really you're expanding your click to these different areas of value that also overlap with the consumer. So before it would be, for example, was this based on product? You, you, someone would go to uh, a company and they would really, really like the product. And then, um, and then that's how kind of like the relationship was built on. But now as we see it, brands are, are now having to extend and, and deal with more um, social matters. Yeah. For example, you know, equality, um, gender, all that stuff now. So now it's like you're, now companies to go beyond just, okay, we provide the best products and services. So come to us and, and, and you'll value it to now it's like, okay, we probably provide the best products and services, but also we understand that, okay, this is some of your values as well. We share some of those values. So that's something that's becoming really important as the company is expanding kind of like their web of values, right? So that it starts to, um, you know, really get connected with yeah. their consumers as more of a whole rather than just product service buy type yeah. of relationship. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I just did an interview with an author, uh, Lynn Yap. She wrote uh, uh, The Altruistic Capitalist. Okay. And, you know, basically, you know, what we were talking about is you know, these companies are getting squeezed on three sides. The consumer wants them to be socially, environmentally, socially mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, management responsible, but investors right. are actually asking for that same thing. And now mm -hmm. employees are kind of stepping up and wanting that same thing. So companies are, you know, they're really going to get squeezed into doing the right things and Right. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of making sure that uh, we develop some checks and balances because, uh, you know, one of my questions always is, hey, I can tell you I'm environmentally uh, sensitive while I'm, you know, pouring, you know, toxic waste out the back door here. <laughs> so, you know, it's easy. Sometimes it's easier said than done. Exactly. I think as you brought some really good points there in, in terms of that would be more of a, an accountability uh, accountability issue. Right. Uh, when, you know, somebody or, or let's say an entity or, or a brand, for example, or a company or business mentions that they're going to do uh, a certain task, do they actually carry out with it? Right. And, you know, social media is that's one of the things that has enabled uh, people the, the ability to self uh, express themselves and, and brands to have social identities as well. And that's how, uh, you know, the, the ability to communicate uh, effectively. And I, I, and I think that's where the key is that the communication because all those channels are there is now how, uh, from a brand point of view, how did they communicate with their consumers based on, let's say, carrying through, uh, and showing accountability for, uh, what it is that they had mentioned, right. And, and broadcast to the public. Yeah. Yeah. I had one other question kind of sure. back on the uh, council on the cancel culture, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of this, uh, maybe like a heightened state of agitation that a right. lot of people are in for, you know, what we, all the uncertainties that we've talked about. So is part of this um, um, like an illusion of control issue is that things have been so out of everybody's control. It's kind of, these things have been forced on us for the last year. Or so now I've got some control to right. get on social media. And I, I realize social media, mm -hmm. the reach that we have there, Mm -hmm. has influenced it some, but do we, do you think that it's part of this trying to gain a little bit of control back of our life? I think, I think that's the goal for pretty much anybody, right? When, when we really look at it, I, I think what has happened has just kind of opened the doors to more what was really going on. And then, uh, but um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, in terms of that sense of control, 
it's it could be just you know can i communicate with this person can yeah. i share my ideas right so um that's something i don't think will ever ever change is this now there's a lot more opportunities and and channels to share and 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 to express uh you know what someone is feeling um and thinking so uh in terms of that is this you know that, that's just the, the way that we're we're moving in in terms of uh you know a, a, a wide platform for people to communicate but there's also things that come out of it where um obviously you know they they would have to be you know there, there's certain things that um that comes with like the good path like the positives and negatives of of any situation right so is this a matter of how do we navigate this to make sure people are still heard but done in a way that continues to move our society forward yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i've always communicated with businesses as a consumer because um you know a lot of times i feel like the business may not know what's going wrong because right. they're not necessarily their own customer every day so mm -hmm. sometimes it just doesn't hurt to politely i'll stress that politely you know reach out to the company and say hey i had this experience and then if if they're good and they do what they're supposed to by saying mm -hmm. well we probably made a mistake let me yeah. take, we'll fix it that's awesome you know but again we've talked a little bit about um reviews and things like that mm -hmm. you know don't throw gasoline on that one either and you know just start a yeah well you're a pretty bad consumer so you know right because <laughs> i yeah. have seen those where it's like the, you know somebody reaches out with what may be a legitimate issue and the business owner just goes uh all crazy on them exactly well it comes down as you mentioned to, to accountability as well right for the for but but it's it's almost like the way to see it is it, it, the responsibility lies on all parties involved Right. So at the end of the day, a, a company could only control what they can control. Just like in, in real life, uh, an individual could only can control what they can control. So, so the, the approach needs to be a very holistic approach where it takes in all these different factors and variables rather than just singling one variable out and saying that, hey, we fix this, everything else is going to fall in this place. But here, as you mentioned, um, you know, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of changes that are happening or that has happened over the last year and a half that are influencing the way that people think, feel, and expressing themselves. So, so the, you know, the concept needs to take in all those different, um, all those different drivers and then find the best way to make all, make everything align as best as possible. So that as a unit or as a collective unit, um, you know, it, it moves from in the direction that you want it to come rather than, okay, you fix one thing, but then uh, the muffler falls off. For example, right. So there, there's there's different aspects to the situation that um, you know has a much greater chance of success when they're addressed uh, together. Yeah, yeah. And there's a good technique. It's called something about the difference between how you uh, uh, how you react and how you respond. You know, we can mm -hmm. take that all in, but if we'll take about two, three, four breaths before we actually respond, sometimes we'll be uh, much better off in the long run for that. Exactly. That's a great point. There's actually a book and, and uh, maybe that's what you're alluding to by Mel Robbins written in 2017 called the five second rule. And oh. that's, that's probably where, um, you know, there's probably a connection between that, but, it, but it's pretty much saying that it, you know, it, confronted with a situation, instead of just acting out really quick, uh, take, take the time to count uh, backwards five, four, three, two, one, because what that does, it actually, um, you know, allocates the, the blood from that agitated part of the brain where it's just so easy to just to like you know lash out at somebody back into the cortex so it turns it back on and then uh, it turns the logical side of the um, you know the, the process back and and then from there on you know it could be one step to reducing uh, an impulsive action for example but it also works the other way where if someone's in a uh, let's say stage or a stage of procrastination also counting down from five will um will will bring the blood flow back into the cortex mm -hmm. and then um that would be the moment to act otherwise um you know nobody's going to take any action and um you know things get procrastinated or delayed for x amount of time yeah. right so so same idea there but the the neuroscience is well, how are you how are you allocating the the blood flow from one area of the brain to the next in order to really turn on the part of the brain that you need to work. No, well, that's cool. I have, I'm gonna try that. I need to take the trash out after a while. I'm gonna do that and see if I can get motivated to carry, yeah, carry it exactly. out. Exactly. <laughs> so, so there's different things. And you know, the, the, the primal brain and, and the logical brain, 
it's almost like this tug of war because the primal brain wants things now. It's almost like the little kid, right? Wants things now, it's impulsive. Whereas the logical brain is like the grown up adult, for example, or the parent. And, and they're more in, in the primal brain or the uh, logical brain is more long term thinking. So, so it's a matter of, you know, how do you come up with strategies to, to make them work together, very similar to your situation with, you know, you're taking businesses with, um, you know, consumers and so forth. And everyone is having this big uh, conversation with each other. And then, uh, but making sure that the conversations are, are, um, you know, very valuable and, and, uh, and, and effective, right, in terms of moving things in the right direction, as opposed to just, you know, talking about a bunch of things, and then just adding more, more powder to the to the keg, if you want to call it. Right. Yeah. So what are some, let's look at the, uh, some, as we open up a mm-hmm. lot of, uh, well, let's just kind of stick with restaurants for a minute, because I know right. some of them have kind of limited menus they've mm-hmm. cut it down to be more manageable they're still doing a lot of takeout and they still encourage a lot of takeout i know that mm-hmm. you know we've had um places around here that you know they just have to close the dining room down because they don't have staff to staff right it up. but what are some things that businesses can do to um i guess to be proactive with the consumer about uh, i don't know coaxing them back or you know, trying to right. leave to let them know kind of what's going on, so that it doesn't have to turn into a thing. Everybody can understand not the way we want to operate. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. we just have to operate this way. Yeah. So, so, so the number one thing is obviously to make it safe. If let's say your restaurant, you 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 have a dining room, the, that's the number one thing, right? So let's say that there's a restaurant that's open, and they want to encourage people to come. Uh, that they know it's going to be safe, but also quick at the same time. They're not saying they're waiting for, you know, two hours to get a seat. So they're going to have to have the, the restaurants going to have some sort of system in place to facilitate that, uh, that, uh, just that, that traffic, let's say it gets really, really busy because the last thing, especially right now is have a, have a, a waiting consumer because that primal brain already, it goes, look, I want, now is my opportunity to get out and then and have some sort of social life other than this thing at home for the last 18 months but now let's say they get there and then and then they find out that they have to now wait another half an hour two hours or whatever it is like that's just gonna really take someone over the edge right so so what you know one of the things is just having processes in place where it could help facilitate kind of like that that type of traffic if or even um you know uh, one of the one of the restaurants is uh one of the things they could do is um, assuming that they have the resources is, is to actually expand their patio yeah. Right. So that's something that, you know, like, because chances are most restaurants, they can't just knock down a wall yeah. and then like put more tables in there. But the patio, assuming that there's space there, um, that's a much more cost efficient way to add more chairs. That would be instead of, um, you know, without doing that, uh, you know, the, the customer that waits there for two hours now only has to, you know, the, the waiting time is a lot shorter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen around here some that have even taken up some of their parking space, you know, if they have enough extra parking, mm-hmm. picking up some of those front parking spaces and setting up tents and outside. Exactly. That's yeah. Just thing. doing those, uh, those things that will make a big difference for the customer experience. Right. And, and obviously, um, you know, uh, everybody has kind of been inside for the last uh, year and a half is, is yeah, is, is now continue to, to market and, and to get be front of mind again. Right. So that's going to be a huge thing in terms of, um, you know, being, being on the radar again. Yeah. Yeah. And I think communication, uh, we uh, can't overstress that enough as we just mm-hmm. have, have a good open line of communication. And the, the gym that I go to, uh, they actually put a meter on um, uh, the little, you have an app that you have to show the card when you walk mm-hmm. through the door, but they put a little meter on it to show how crowded it is. So, right. You know, and I think that was pretty cool because, you can evaluate even if you want to go over there not let's just don't even think about the, the covid crisis for a minute just mm-hmm. you don't want to go to a crowded gym have to stand around and wait to get on a machine so it allows a customer to be a little bit more informed and you know some of these restaurants would do good at just being honest and uh, you know some of them think that they're doing mm-hmm. they're uh, some of them think that they're being a little bit tricky by saying Oh yeah, well, just 15 minutes, but you know, when 15 turns mm-hmm. into 45, then all you've done is really make some people mad. Exactly. So that, that's actually really neat to hear that the 
the gym that you go to actually has that type of uh, it, in neuroscience it's called biometrics it's almost like oh what's your heart rate yeah. right or, or like that's what it is or the, pe- the dilation of the people uh people for example or um you know for uh I- instruments that are measuring uh this kind of like your physiological reaction yeah. and responses to stimuli so from the outside for example you know in the in the medical uh field uh, let's say in the operation room you know they, they, they would hook you up to those machines and they'll show you your heart rate so so you would know how the person is actually what where they're at on a physiological level yeah. so the same thing applies not to the, let's say the gym or the restaurant where people know oh there's some sort of indication or external uh, indicator that says oh this restaurant's like 90 percent full for example so that's going to impact whether someone's okay with coming there knowing that they're going to wait a long time or or being like okay you know what uh maybe i'm, I'm gonna have to have a look at another another option right and, and, and that's one of the reasons why uber and, and you know a lot of companies follow suit is to have you're able to track your uber driver <laughs> because that eliminates the stress of, you know, where's my food, right? right? It eliminates that fear, right? So it brings that level of certainty and be like, oh, you know, like the, my food is only five minutes away and so forth. It's, it's that's, a, that's a similar type of concept when it comes to, oh, this restaurant is, you know, 80%, 90% full. Um, do I want to go here or not? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that applies to a, a lot of things. And I just, I'll use me for example, is, you know, you want to be patient and you want to wait. So let's take right. food delivery. It's like, they said it'd be here in 20 minutes. Okay. It's been 30, but you know what? They're behind traffic. we got all this mm-hmm. stuff. And so you can be patient. And then all of a sudden when you're at 45 minutes, you're like, Hey, we're, you know, it's kind of like, there's this line where you're patient, you're right. patient, but you never know, you know, when do I, uh, when do I not be patient? When do I pick up the phone and give mm-hmm. somebody a call? I don't want to rush them right. I know that there's external circumstances. And so uh, this is again, backward communication and, you know, implementing uh, whatever we can to right. help that customer understand where they are in their journey. It just, it's invaluable. Oh, exactly. So, you know, having some sort of system that will let someone know almost like an ordering system, for example, if you're at the back, working and creating the the meals there's there's some sort of timeline i know like if you look at fast food restaurant for example they'll let you know hey like in 60 seconds where should it be along the way pretty much and, and the same thing would apply from a consumer point of view when they're looking to engage with the company right it's kind of like i'm waiting in line here where what position am i in line you know and and, and then the groceries uh or in the earlier like they, they i think they removed that system was everybody used to take a ticket you remember oh, that awesome. oh you wanted you wanted your favorite cold cut uh, meats, for example, uh, here, here's the machine and take a number and we'll call your number. So at least you like, you know, it's, it's very straightforward. It's, it's hard to say, Hey, look, I'm before you, right. If someone's holding a ticket with a, with a number closer to being yeah. front of line. So it's a similar idea. Oh my, yeah. And that back, that it's pretty good, except it backfired at the uh, driver's license office. You know, when you walk up there and you mm-hmm. see the click and like, they're on number 10 and you pull like number 312 off of the machine. <laughs> like, yeah. So there, there's, there's, there's always going to be some sort of variation, <laughs> right. Where, where it could work for, or in that case, you know, a lot of people, because they're not too excited to renew, to do those tasks. But, but if someone goes, Oh, look, I'm moving up in the line. And I know that, Hey, I'm going to, let's say finally get seated and have a meal. Then the type of anticipation is different, right? So there's yeah. different, what's happening is the dopamine is the activities the two different activities are have a different impact on 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 the dopamine levels right well felix we appreciate you taking time out of your day to come talk with us this is all great information Mm -hmm. i just uh you know i think that this is such an interesting uh discipline and it's needed i mean you know as sales and as marketing we want to be able to reach our customers give them the message and Right. All the activities that we need to do, you know, in order to make that a pleasant experience for sure. Perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Roy, and to be on your podcast. And I'm just uh, absolutely privileged to uh, be a return guest on here. And I hope that uh, our conversation here is going to provide a lot of insights to um, you know, help your listeners um, in their uh, entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. Yeah, it will. And uh, I'll do like I did last time. I'll, uh, you know, extend an invitation to get you back on here in two or three months and see kind of, you know, how this environment has changed. And, mm-hmm. you know, if there's anything that as businesses that we need to be doing, you know, a little bit different to take care of, 
you know, the other thing we, we talk a lot about prospects, but mm -hmm. uh, also to take care of our current customers. I mean, that's, yeah. that's an important thing. Sometimes we, you know, and I'm, I'm guilty of that. We think about how we're going to get the next new guy and we're not thinking about taking care of the people mm -hmm. that we've got under already. Yeah. That's a really, that's a really good one is, um, you know, they're, that's why they're a customer, right? It's uh, it would make sense to take care of them. Okay. So, um, I think yeah. that goes a huge way and, and, and the consumer, the customer, they'll definitely remember that. Yeah. All right. Well, tell us, uh, give us another, uh, tool or another habit. Give us something that you do every day, uh, that really mm -hmm. adds a lot of value to your life, either professionally or personally. I would say, uh, meditating, okay. uh, meditating even for 10, 15 minutes. Uh, you know, it, it, it certainly has a way to rewire the brain, makes things a lot more calmer, clears up the thinking. Um, and, and that's something that will, you know, generally what I found my personal experience to impact how the rest of the day goes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, personally, that's something that has been uh, effective for in my own life. And, um, you know, hopefully that will encourage some people to try that and then see how it uh, affects, uh, you know, their life moving forward. Yeah, and I'm pretty new at this. I've been trying it. And one thing I implemented mm -hmm. was in the evening too, because it gives me a little bit of separation from whatever I was doing until, you know, trying to lay down and sleep. It exactly. Head. But, you know, what, what I have to say is I am not good at it. And I find myself some days being all over the place. But mm -hmm. I think it's one of these things you just have to stay after it. Because yeah, you, you just practice, right? <laughs> like there, there's no easy way around it. Like as, as much as we like to take, you know, some sort of accelerated shortcut, it, it doesn't matter of, um, you know, it's, it's like typically if, if uh, you know, a baby is getting born, it needs nine months kind yeah, of thing, yeah. right? So it's uh, anything rushing it. Um, it does, it does, does it, like it typically does not work as well as we'd like to exactly. like it to. Yeah. And the other thing I, uh, I'm going to start, I've heard this last week is a guy that he actually implemented uh, a little, maybe not, you know, 10 minutes, but maybe two or three of mm -hmm. meditation and breathing in between when switching tasks. And I thought, wow, that's an awesome idea because I've never thought of that. You know, you're mm -hmm. really engaged in whatever you're right. doing and you have to stop and try to engage. And it takes just a little bit of time to make that, uh, transition so mm -hmm. anyway that's i think that's really cool yeah that's very similar to the whole idea of uh taking naps throughout the day rather than just having a big sleep at night right so yeah so it's this on a micro scale um it's, it's kind of like these mini meditation sessions in between each uh each task to um, you know allow the brain maybe to make sense of um, all the different activities and, and kind of create some sort of barrier so it doesn't get all mushed together right I actually, I saw, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you one more question. Yeah, absolutely. No, there just was actually, uh, I, I read a piece just the other day about uh, napping in the afternoon again. I don't mm -hmm. know, it's trying to make a research, you know, make a resurgence, but they were just saying, you know, how much more productive that we could be right. by taking, I think it said like a 30 minute nap. Uh, what, mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? Well, there are studies, I, but, uh, I believe in Europe, that's a quite common uh, practice. Um, can't remember the specific country. So, but but from what I recall, and, and of course we could always look at it. Is Sweden, they highly encourage that, um, and, and it, it seems to maybe have the same effect as, uh, you know, the 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 one tip, which is to have those kind of like mini naps or meditation sessions in between, right? And, and allows like the brain to kind of recharge itself instead of just going full throttle right. for so long. So, so it's a, so it's like, it's really a way for the brain to stay, kind of take breaks yeah. so that it could begin to like kind of recharge, uh, you know, consolidate the, the memories and so forth and, um, and, and then get going again, because, um, you, you know, as much as we'd like to go at hundred percent, um, you know, that's just a fast way to go to burnout mode too. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, Felix. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, we'll get you back on here and we can talk a lot more. There's a lot of great information for our audience for sure. Excellent. But uh, You bet. So that's going to do it for another episode of the Business of Business podcast. Of course, you can find us at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. We're on all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Spotify. We're not on one that you listen to please reach out. I'd be glad to get it added and make it easier for your listening. Also, we're on all the major social media platforms, 
uh, probably hang out on Instagram a little bit more than anywhere else. So reach out there. We'd love to interact with you. A video of this interview will go up on our YouTube channel. So be sure and check that out when the episode goes live. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of your business.